who knew podcasting was so easy? <laughs> All right, welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off-Road Podcast. I'm Big Z, and in the studio today, I am without any cohorts, but I am joined with a, uh, I guess you could call him a legend of the industry. Uh, he's been around for a little while. Uh, I'm joined by John Crowley, and uh, John Crowley Jr., sorry, and uh, and you might know him a little bit better of uh, utvguide.net fame. Uh, he's been around the block a few times with the, uh, with the industry, and I'm excited to talk with him today about uh, some of the ventures he's walking on today. Uh, or this month, I should say. It's, an, it's a pretty long, epic adventure. So uh, welcome to the show, uh, John. How you doing? Good. Great to be here. Uh, so you are not, I would say, at home, <laughs> which I guess uh, technically no, a year. Not at home. <laughs> <laughs> I guess a hotel room is home for, for the next while. Uh, uh, yeah, we're uh, in Nashville. My wife, uh, Teresa, is with me. Uh, we're on a, a, a month-long cross-country trip. Uh, and uh, we, we're a, almost two weeks into it. Wow. So it's already been two weeks. It's been flying by for, uh, for me watching I, it. I think so. It's been flying by uh, for us as well. Um, <laughs> it's a, a pretty fast paced. Um, we left uh, on a Thursday night uh, and traveled down to Sand Hollow, Utah was our first stop. Wow. What, a, what an amazing place that is. I mean, we've said it on the show probably four or five times now how amazing that place is. It's one of my favorite spots uh, just to go. It's easy, uh, lots of different trails, um, super fun to explore around and, and show, uh, especially I was there showing some new, some friends, uh, the area that hadn't been there before, and they were super excited about it. Well, let's, uh, before we get into that, let's talk a little bit of backstory, uh, just so the community and the audience uh, listening knows a little bit more about you and what you've been doing. Um, I, I know you from utvguide.net uh, as somebody that came into the industry uh, in 2016 myself. Uh, I came in a little bit later in the game, you might say. Uh, there's a lot of people coming into the game now uh, talking uh, about how the UTV's just been the industry's just been exploding over the last year, right? Yep. Uh, so there's a lot of people just joining our, our communities. Um, and so I think it's important to interact with some of these uh, people, personalities, brands, things like that, that people might not know about yet. Um, but I know you from utvguide.net, a website that covers uh, industry news and events, things like that. And so I came in, uh, like I said, I, I got my first Razor in 2000, at the end of 2016, the initial uh, Razor Turbo. And, um, you know, so I started looking for websites and, and community groups and all that kind of stuff and ran across some of the stuff you've been doing. But uh, so you run that operation. Uh, and I was looking at the website and you, I thought it was like 2011 you started, but that was way back before then when you started. So I think I went back on your website, I was looking at like one of the first posts. Do you remember what the first post on your website was? <laughs> um, it, uh, the, the thing, well, I, before UTV guide, I, I started a, a website called dune guide oh, um, right, right, right. and it's, it's kind of shoved off on the side that still exists, but I can't update it. It was built on front page 2003, oh, wow. <laughs> uh, and it, it still exists in that, but I can't, uh, you can't even nobody touch does, it, huh? <laughs> nobody does that anymore. Um, and, uh, I was out at sand mountain and, uh, a friend had a, uh, Yamaha Rhino pretty much stock and um, took it for a ride uh, around Sand Mountain. I was like, wow, this is neat. Um, I could see uh, these things taking off. And uh, at, at that point, I started UTV Guide. Um, yeah, so that's exactly, I, I would, you nailed it. That's uh, That was February 2007. And you posted President's Weekend at Sand Mountain. Uh, and that's pretty awesome to see those original vehicles, those rhinos being used out on the dirt like that. Um, and uh, so that I mean, it just impressed me because, I, like I said, I thought my headspace was at about like 2010, 2011. But no, you were you were starting the game back then. So uh, tell yeah. us a little bit about uh, UTV Guide, how that came to be. And, and like you just said, you, you just started the website, but uh, it, it became more than that. It came more of like a, a industry representation brand and, and things like that where, where the OEs and people would communicate communicate with you to start getting content out like just tell us a little bit of the story of how you guys grew and, and became what you were well at, at first i was a um uh, i i started the website um but i was also uh, i did freelance writing um for a couple different publications um uh sand addiction magazine which doesn't exist anymore uh side by side uh, action magazine uh sand sports magazine so i was writing uh for those 
and just just saw that the internet was going to be where uh, things went. And it was kind of the right time for that kind of uh, content. And um, it just grew. The, uh, the, the manufacturers noticed what I was doing. And uh, I was invited to all the, all the different press intros for new vehicle uh, releases. And um, uh, and just became a, a news site and a review site for, for all those things. Um, that continued on where I was covering all manufacturers. Um, and uh, the space just got so busy um, and changed. Uh, social media became a big part of it. Uh, you know, YouTube, uh, everything just changed how uh, editors got news out on things. So uh, I tried to adapt to that. I saw uh, Facebook as a big deal, uh, Instagram as a big deal. Um, I, I haven't started podcasts. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> we should talk. Uh, so <laughs> I know how to do that. <laughs> I, nah, I know. Uh, I, I, I'm kind of a one man show, so Same I can't here. do any, every, everything, right? Yep. Um, it's, it's hard to be good at everything you do. I, I just am so, so on a lot. A lot of different things uh so I, I try to cover as many bases as i can um but the as the side-by-side market became uh I mean, more and more manufacturers came into it um it got really hard for me to cover everybody right well um and the space was changing to more of an influencer based uh, ambassador type situation and, and, and a lot of, uh, with a lot of manufacturers. Um, so a couple of years ago, I, uh, decided to just focus in on one brand and uh, now I'm a, a Can-Am ambassador. So I still do the same things. I, I, I want to go out and ride, uh, explore, do adventure things with, uh, side-by-sides. I'm just doing it with one particular uh brand which is uh K&M now so that that kind of takes you back a little bit to your roots where you know the first content pieces that you were working on were like you know trail ride oriented about the experience about being out and doing things and and yeah. location base and stuff and that and that ties in directly to how you're kind of full circle now you know doing this trip that you're doing and covering these locations and these brands um you know, so you, like you were saying, the industry has changed quite a bit over the years, right? Like we're seeing, yeah. you know, not just an explosion of new and innovative products. We're seeing an explosion of the aftermarket and the accessories and the suspension upgrades and the all the, the aftermarket, right? And we're starting to see the community now jo- join in and become more of a voice in the industry and, and, the, and the community influencing the manufacturing and things like that. And we're starting to see, you know, uh, niche specific vehicles being launched and things things like that. Um, you know, so, so a little bit, can you, can you give us a little perspective on your side of how, how the industry has changed over the last, you know, three to five years on, you know, how the community's integrated and not just in the, the influencer space or the marketing space, but just in the industry as a whole, what are you seeing as somebody that's been, you know, pretty close to the industry? Um, what are some of the things that you've seen that changed dramatically over the last few years? Loaded question, well, I know. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I could, I could attack that from five different ways. Um, so from a vehicle standpoint, I mean, obviously, uh, the, you look back three years, five years, 10 years, it's phenomenal, the, the capabilities uh, the, and, and the, all the changes that have come about. Uh, if, if you're coming in new to this whole thing, it's like, well, gosh, why are they taking so long to come out with things? Uh, um, but uh, looking back, it, we're, I mean, the first Rhino was what, 23 horsepower or something like that. And we're at 195 with a, a, a turbo can M and Maverick X3 now. And it's, uh, we're worlds apart. I mean, right. what you can do with the vehicles is just, um, how do you Amazing. think that's influenced the approach to getting outdoors and going places like, you know, back with the Rhino is more like we're going to a, a dune or a place where the, it's not really too aggressive. It's not real too challenging because these cars basically just roll on the dirt. They don't do, they don't have 20 inches of travel on the suspension. They don't have 18 inches of clar- clearance or whatever, right? You're, you're a little bit more limited. Now we have these machines that are fully capable of doing pretty much anything you want them to be. They're basically trophy trucks out of the dealership. Um, you know, how has that influenced the destinations and the travel for you guys? 
Well, you can travel more comfortably uh, and longer um, in the vehicles now. So I, I love to do adventure rides. Um, one of the things uh, we we did is uh, on this trip, we went. I took Teresa into the Grand Canyon. Um, and it, uh, we took the kind of the shorter, easier route, but it was still 55 miles each way. Um, and, you know, it was a half day trip. Right. You know, so you know, we're doing 110 miles. Um, back when you're in just a utility vehicle, you couldn't go that fast uh, and that it, with that much comfort. Um, yeah, you'd so be pretty it, sore by, by the end of 55 miles. It, it allows you to go further and see more mm -hmm. uh, and get out there and do things. But uh, you know, truth be told, I some of the utility vehicles are still just as capable of getting you to places and allowing you to get uh, you know see neat things out there. And that's that's what I like uh, about UTVs is they give you an opportunity to go places and see things that you can't do just you know on foot or in your you know truck. Right. It's just. I don't want to take my truck on you know, 55 miles on a dirt road. <sighs> uh, you know, it, it would come back, you know, with new rattles and you know, it would never be the same. <laughs> right. Uh, that, and that's what it offered vehicles for. Ian and I have talked multiple times about how we've gone on these long trips, like across Washington state or across Idaho state on these UTVs and how, yeah, technically speaking, we could get into a Jeep or into a, a Toyota or something and do these things. But the experience, uh, well, first of all, the machine itself would come back completely different, but sure. <laughs> the, the, the experience is completely different too. You're, you're more connected with the outdoors while you're doing that, that trip. And there's a, yep. there's just a different feel, a different, you, different sense overload when you're in a UTV experiencing these locations. And I would I would be saying that there's probably a little bit different memory scope, like the things that you remember is completely different on a UTV than in a in a standard vehicle, right? Like in the vehicle, you're closed off from the dust, you have air conditioning, you have radio, you have kind of those creature comforts. And when you're in a UTV out on these trails, um, you're smelling the surrounding, you're, you're tasting the dust, you're, um, you know, your, having, your hands having are, mud flip on your lap. <laughs> sometimes it's not mud. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, it's just a different experience altogether. And I think that's what people connect with once they do it eventually, right? Like they, they put off UTVs for a while and then, and then they experience it. And I think that's kind of one of the things that's happened over the last couple of years. People are having friends that have these and getting out and experiencing it for the first time and things like that. Um, but it's a completely different world overlanding on a UTV versus like a, like a, a, a truck. So, um, sure. I think that's kind of fueling some of this adventure. And I think the OEs are starting to work towards that marketing too. I think they're trying to market that go further, go longer, go to these places that you yep. haven't actually thought about going yet. Right. Um, yeah. is that what you're saying? Oh, absolutely. Uh, the, the type of stuff, uh, I've been trying to focus on the last couple of years is more, uh, adventure ride type things where, you know, I haven't been here before I do. I use a, a GPS app uh, called Gaia to help uh, plan and, and route. And, and it's neat because it, it, you do investigation ahead of time. I've never been there, but I want to search and find neat places to go to. And it allows you to, you know, find and create routes uh, to places and, and then go in on that adventure. And, and hopefully it works out and your, your investigation ahead of time, uh, pays off. And it's funny because I use the same mapping software. Um, I've tried a number of different ones and, and I keep coming back to Gaia. Uh, and, and the different layers are interesting because I'll be planning a route and we'll be going, you know, through a mountain range or whatever. And then I'll zoom in and all of a sudden this little pin pops up and says, hey, there's a lookout right here. Go check it out. Yeah. And it's like, oh, all right, deviate exactly. and, <laughs> and go check it out. And then and those 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 adventures off off the planned trail are usually the more memorable ones than actually being on the trail, right? It's like the things that you find on the trail and you, and if you give yourself, if you plan yourself time to deviate, right? If you just say, I'm going to plan an extra hour on this trip just to go off trail and come back. Um, you'll usually find some interesting things, a cave, a lookout, a fire tower, a, you know, a whatever. Um, yep. and, uh, like when we, we traveled, when we traveled across to Idaho, it was pretty, 
evident that the time allotment we gave for that trip was at least maybe a third of what we wanted because there were so many things to see along the way and we wish we had time to, to, to go off trail and, and check those things out. Yeah. So uh, speaking cool. of trails and adventures, you're on a pretty big one yourself. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you got going on over there. Uh, so my wife and I uh, are on a, a month long trip uh, across country. It, 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 the idea just kind of came about when uh, we saw some stuff on the uh, Hatfield McCoy trails in uh, West Virginia, uh, right on the, the border of Kentucky and West Virginia. And I've been there before uh, on uh, a couple manufacturer uh, rides, um, but never really explored it. And I showed it to my wife, Teresa, and it was like, well, okay, let's go sometime. And, um, the other thing that kind of fueled, uh, this month long trip is, um, we, we both love to visit national parks. Um, and, and Teresa likes to, uh, conquer them by getting a stamp in her passport. <laughs> there you book. go. Yeah. Uh, that old sticker it's, on the back of the RV. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> so for this trip, um, uh, we are visiting 15 different national parks. Um, so we've kind of created our path through the, the country so we can hit different um, national parks. And obviously, we're not riding uh, in all of those. But um, the one that we did uh, ride to is uh, the north side of the, the north rim of the Grand Canyon. But all the other ones are, we're doing hiking. So mixed in with that, uh, we're also uh, hitting eight eight or nine different off-road areas. So it's just got kind of a mix of a trip. Uh, and, and we're also doing touristy stuff here in Nashville and, and some other places. Um, we're traveling in, in my truck with our uh, Can Am X3 on the, on the back. Um, so right, we're so you have a cab nim- over rack, nimble. not a trailer. You're not pulling. I'm, I'm not pulling a trailer. It, I've got a long bed uh truck so it's actually it's not over the cab it's just on, on the back okay um oh it's, and, a, flat, it's uh, a flat deck it's a flat deck but gotcha. i still have the bed it's not a flat bed right. uh, um, truck um, so that allows us to be fairly nimble you don't have to worry about um you know where you're parking with the trailer and you know all those kind of things it, it's kind of strange here in in nashville i'm we're staying in downtown Nashville and picked my daughter up at the airport and I've got to worry about how tall I am. <laughs> right. Um, I'm just over 11 feet tall. So it's like, well, I can't fit in a normal garage. And right. uh, I was worried about going to the airport to pick my, our, our daughter up because uh, there's low overhangs. A lot of times in airports, it's like, I don't know if I can get through here or not. So you gotta, um, we're valet parked out in front of the hotel. Um, it, so I've got all kinds of people looking at, you know, looking at the uh, thing as I walk by on the street because it's just been sitting in front of the right. hotel in downtown Nashville. Yeah, you don't have to worry um, about pulling a trailer downtown, but you do have to worry about the height change. It's a give and take. Yeah. Uh, and uh, fuel consumption is uh, it's it's weird. Uh, if you pull a trailer, you get better fuel mileage than if it's right. sitting up on top because the wind is just horrible. So, um We've, we've done about 3000 miles in my truck so far and, um, uh, we're going through some, uh, mix. We've, we've kind of almost followed highway 40 out once we, uh, hit uh, Flagstaff coming in and we've been diving down below 40 and then back up on the other side of 40 and working our way there. We're, we're trying not to take interstates, but, uh, we did just the other day coming up from Arkansas to, um, Nashville. Gotcha. So you guys started in California and you've hit Utah, Arizona, uh, New Mexico, Texas. Now you're in, uh, you went through Arkansas, now Tennessee. Um, and then you're going to be Oklahoma. Yeah. And then you're going to be going, you're going to continue up over all the way to the east and then come back. And you're going to come back a different route, right? Yep. A little bit farther north. Um, the timing was set uh, originally. Um, we had it set to hit two different off road events. Um, UTV takeover in Grundy, Virginia. We were going to hit that, but that was postponed uh, because of COVID. But we were going to hit UTV takeover in West Virginia and then rally on the rocks in Moab. So we're still hitting rally on the rocks. That's kind of our our end game coming back uh, around the other way um, and mixing in all these different national parks as we uh, as we go. So now that you're uh, roughly 
a little bit between two, a third and a half way through this whole thing. Um, you know, what are some of your takeaways from the trip so far? And uh, what are your more memorable moments from the trip so far? And I know there's a lot because you're hitting all these epic places, uh, yeah. right? <laughs> um, I, th- I think probably my favorite was to, to get Teresa to the north rim of the uh, Grand Canyon. Um, that's been a spot that I've been to four or five times. Uh, she's never been there and it, it's a kind of a long, long road to get in. It's, you know, 55 miles off road and she's never had the opportunity to go in there with me, but it's, it's, it's really a neat spot because, um, there's no railings. Uh, you're, you're, you you got to go off road to get there. Uh, you can do it in a street vehicle, but it, it's a long ways in and out. A slow, uh, and a slow drive. Of, yeah especially the last uh, five miles or so it's kind of rough um, but the the views are spectacular it's a 3,000 foot drop off the edge of the rim and it definitely definitely gets your heart pumping you know looking looking over the edge of the thing going oh my gosh I could fall 3,000 feet right here yeah there's no saving um, after that <laughs> yeah yeah um, so did the, you start in uh, San Hollow and go to the Grand Canyon or did you go no we we so we spent a couple days in San Hollow riding uh, and then uh, when we left Sand Hollow, we went over to uh, towards Kanab uh, and started in Colorado City. It's kind of a cheater route as far as I'm <laughs> concerned. But <clears throat> I thought uh, we were just going to be doing it alone. Yeah. So my uh, way of doing uh, things, I, I don't usually go off on uh, my own on adventures like that, I like to have a friend uh, right. with a toe strap. Yep. yep. <laughs> so, <laughs> I hear you. You can always get yourself out <laughs> one way or the other. So we, we took the kind of the easiest way in, uh, mostly graded roads, um, for, you know, 45 miles or so. And then the last bit is, is a little bit rougher. So that, that trail system, is it, uh, pretty much just all dust or is there some scenic stuff along the way on that particular way in, um, it, it's not as scenic. Uh, the way I've, I've gone in before is from Mesquite, but it's more like a hundred miles. Um, so Mesquite, Nevada, um, you, you're kind of winding your way all the way through. There's a neat, uh, bar, uh, bartend ranch, uh, that you can stay, uh, at, um, and they they've got you know a hotel not a hotel but a, a, you know beds you can rent uh, um, they serve you breakfast and, and dinner they, they've actually got an airport uh, that you can fly in and out of um, where some people doing um, rafting trips can come in right, okay. from there um, and then so you could spend the night there and then go over to Toro Weep on the Grand Canyon and then come back and there's a lot of different ways in but um, uh, for other for this trip, we we were took taking an easy route. Um, and time was we did have part of that concern too, right? Time was a little bit. Um, we we did have Lance from uh, Rally on the Rocks join us, so that was nice to have a, a friend with a toe strap with us. <laughs> <laughs> Just you never know. Um, but yeah, we were we we're getting getting through. We've got places to go and things to see, and we don't always have as much time. And that, that's the hard part about this. Is you know we've got a Facebook group just for our adventure and um, a lot of people are chiming in. Oh, you missed this. you missed that. And it's like, well, we can't do, can't do it all. everything <laughs> on this trip. I, I got a month and we've got certain things we need to do. So we're trying to hit as much stuff as we can uh, and, you know, pack it all in, but you, you can only do so much. So that's uh that's one of those things that like, any big trip that you plan it, if it's not just a day ride, you have to plan, you're going to, you're going to take the time for one thing and, and bypass the other thing. And, uh, something like this, you got so many stops and so many things to see and so many people to say hi to, and so many, you know, different things going on that you can't, you can't just stop for every little thing that would be equally an awesome memory. You have to, you have to complete yeah. the trip. So sure. Yeah. And, and we're also using this as kind of a, uh, a way of just seeing different parts of the country right. and figuring out where we might want to come back to and yep. dive deeper into an area. 
That's oh. something that I'm looking forward to this year. Uh, myself being involved with the UTV Takeover event series and getting to some of these states that I haven't been to, Oklahoma, and, and I've never been to the East Coast. So going to Virginia is going to be a new thing. And and seeing just the different uh, terrain and riding styles, the limitations and the and the options and the the culture is completely different, you know, from one area to another. And I think that's an exciting For thing sure. to go experience. And I'm assuming, you know, on your trip, you got everything from California to Arizona, Texas, you got, you know, Louisiana and and all those areas, Arkansas, (laughs) um, Tennessee, um, all those different places are, are so unique in their character and to, to ride them is, is one thing, but to also experience the culture is a completely different part of it. And something that I think everybody should be uh, looking forward to doing on any kind of big trip they plan, you know, like we've said before on, on some of our long trips, stop by those little towns, walk in the little shop, shake hands and, and, and see, you know, what they have to say and what, and what they're excited about. And you'll, you'll start to, to hear stories and, and, and culture that you've never had experience with before. Well, and you, you brought up, uh, Oklahoma and uh, UTV takeover, um, little Sahara sand dunes was one of our stops a few days ago. Um, uh, I've never been to little Sahara. Here, here I own a, a website called Dune Guide, and I've actually never been to Little Sahara. Um, so we called Jim McIntyre from uh, UTV Takeover because he's he's uh, had, held an event there for three, four years, and he knows what's what. So I'm like, do you, do you have anybody we can talk to? Right. So he set us up with uh, Stan, who's a chiropractor in, in Waynoka. Um And, uh, he, and I think it was his wife, um, showed us around the dunes a little bit and then drove us into town and kind of telling us about the area. And then we, we met with the mayor of Waynoka and we had, uh, lunch at, uh, Miss Jamie's and it was neat listening to them talk about their town and how the town is embracing off-road, um, and then trying to build it up more as a off-road destination and to make it so town is accessible to off-roaders and a place that they want to go to as well. Something that we've talked a number of times about is how small communities and not even just like tiny ones, but just not big cities have the opportunity to benefit from embracing off-road. And, you know, the economic impact of tourism is a big deal for a lot of cities. And there's a lot of there's a lot of cities that are progressive and are saying, you know, hey, we'll do whatever it takes. We'll open roads up. We'll, you know, do whatever trail maintenance we need to do to make sure that this happens. But there are some other ones that are so hesitant to or regressive, like we're seeing in in Moab, where they're pushing against against this community. Um, And the unfortunate part of it is that we have so many people that are in love with us and in love with what the experience is, but we have these few bad apples that create, you know, a negative persona in our community. And the, and the unfortunate thing is that sure. it's usually tied to some sort of either partying or some sort of neglect that is usually around the communities that are supporting this supporting our off-road community. So, um, you know, the good off-roaders, the people that are good to the trails that are, are supporting the community, they're out on the trails. They're out doing the thing right yep. and the ones that are causing a stink are the ones that are holding back at the campsite or at back at the town or whatever um and so uh you know was that is that something that you've noticed getting worse over the last couple of years is that something we can start addressing as a community is there a way to help these com- these these towns and these and these leadership roles understand what we're trying to do and and how to influence it in a positive way it's a really tough um a tough problem, but it's not unique to off-roaders. I mean, I, you know, you dr- I drive down the central Valley in, in uh, California and there's trash on the highways all over the place. I mean, so you see the, just a few bad apples in anything can ruin it. Uh, it but it just, it, it, it's hard when 5% can ruin it or 1% can ruin it for, for right. everybody else. Um, but yeah, you've got, we've got to, as a community, try to, um, you know, be good stewards of the land and also good neighbors. Um, you know, if you see a hiker along the trail, you don't just blast, you know, buy him You go slow and, you know, wait for them to pass. All those kind of things make a difference, you know, help out when you can. Um, amongst everything in Moab's, uh, uh, really tough because it's got, it's a Mecca for 
all kinds of uh, out, outdoor recreation. It's not just off-road. There's right. two national parks right there. Um, there's rafting, uh, mountain biking, hiking, all those people into this one tight spot. And we don't always get along. And if you go into that scenario, knowing it, you, you t- try to be um, more welcoming to the other people and, and you know, be nice. <laughs> you know, don't just roost them as you're going <laughs> by. Uh, it, it, the little things make a difference. And um, especially like in like you're saying with Moab, where where the park system set up in a way where you have designated trails to follow, you have designated paths that you're supposed to be staying on um and especially in in an area where there's obstacles right like you you can sometimes quickly get in over your head if you're not careful or if you just don't know and a lot of those places have deviations that you're allowed to take and and options right uh but a lot of times people just take the easy route which is off the mark trail and and then that causes a problem too where you're not respecting the local laws you're not respecting the local authority and 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 that's super important for us to to not leave that that trail behind us of saying, you know, I mean, that's just evidence of our community disrespecting the rules and the community around it. And we need to be yeah. stepping up for that and, 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 and being proactive with our friends. Hey, stop what you're doing. Turn around, go this way. That's the right way to do it. Uh, because yeah. we don't want to lose that, that ability to be in those freedoms that we've, we've currently have kind of on the chopping block with, with certain areas. Yeah. And, and again, it's, it's not something that's just unique to off-roaders. I mean, you right. know, we, Teresa and I love to hike and there's people that cut, you know, cut uh, switchbacks and off trail is just something I think people just aren't educated or too lazy to, uh, you know, follow the right trail, whether yeah. it's off road or hiking or whatever. So, yeah. So you guys are uh, getting this trip under your belt and then at, by the end of month, or is it the end of the, it's mid, mid next month, you'll be done with it, right? Yeah. Yeah, we uh, from here off roading. We're going to hit Windrock um, and then Hatfield McCoy um, for a couple days. And Hatfield McCoy trails. That's uh, a spot uh, where not just one town, but a whole region has embraced off road. You know, a lot of old coal mining towns that you know the towns are are kind of dying, da- dying back yep. and off road is breathing new life into that area. So it's going to be neat to see. I've, I've been there a couple of times uh, with the manufacturers, but um, this will be, you know, we'll have more time to explore on our own and they've embraced it. And there's several different trails you can get to. I mean, you could literally spend a week easily, probably a couple of weeks, just visiting all the different trail systems they've got back there. And the history is incredible, more than just the, you know, the half Phil McCoy uh, feud, but there's tons of, you know, Civil War history and just American um, history. Yeah. Mining history of all kinds of stuff. Yeah. It's a little slice of of the United States back there. Yeah. I've always wanted to go check those out. Those those little towns. uh, I think there's you know, a huge opportunity for those communities to, like you were saying, embrace off-road, but become destination points, right? Like they're not going to be these metropolises, but they're going to be these places that could benefit from saying, hey, we'll set up a little, you know, two, three cabins or whatever that people can stay at. We can have, you know, some sort of um, historical points where you can learn about our area and do these things. And those communities can actually sustain themselves off of that versus, you know, just not having any jobs, not having any resources. This is something that they can look forward to building. So, I, and, and then just the historical part of it. I mean, with so many of us have lost touch with our history and in our surrounding areas and our country and things like that. And this is a, a unique way to one, learn, but also experience our history and see those old, those abandoned mines and those ways of living that people had back however long ago um, that we've forgotten about in this day and age. So um, those are such a, a unique person. Like we went, uh, we were going through Idaho and we came across a little town and it was literally, I don't know, five, six, 10 acres, something like that. And the whole town fit in that little area. And there was a general yeah. store and there was a, a feed store and there was a gas pump and there was whatever. And the entire town was for sale. Like 
<laughs> the whole the whole thing the whole kit and caboodle and the post office and everything was for sale and uh you know it's like it's sad to see that happen but at the same time you know that's maybe an opportunity for someone to say hey we're going to revitalize the area and become a destination right right so uh looking forward to your next couple weeks or whatever uh and then maybe even just into the summer with some of the events that you guys might be going to and whatever what are you looking forward to this year this is something i've been asking a number of our guests over this last few months of getting into 21 and out of this whole stink of last year and, and everything what are you looking forward to on this trip and then this year I, i'm looking forward to traveling without uh uh, restrictions, <laughs> you, <laughs> right. you know, uh, being able to have events, um, you know, I would love to see sand sport super show happen again with, you know, in Costa Mesa where it's always been, um, you know, having UTV takeover at, at, at different locations throughout the country without, uh, having restrictions about the number of people or having to wear a mask, all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, to me that uh, I haven't really slowed down as far as traveling goes. I've, I've, I've still been going, um, but it, it has cut back on the number of events that have happened uh, in, the, in the last year. Um, but uh, as for, I, I still go out and ride and, and do my adventures as much as I can. And I have been for the last year. So that's something that I'm definitely looking forward to this year. Like I was saying earlier about getting to other parts of the country and experiencing some of this, this stuff, uh, the culture and the writing. Um, there's, there's some, there's still some hesitation in our in event space, right? About, are we going to be able to, can we find vendors? Can we find sponsors? Um, with, uh, you know, how we're organizing uh, takeover, you know, basically we're finding that people are, willing to get out and do it right like these sponsors want to get back oh, yeah. to the to the the grind of being out with the community and, and vending um is that kind of the feeling that you're getting from some of the companies you work with they're excited to get back out into the into the community absolutely um and and utv takeover is kind of uh unique um i mean both of us have been involved uh with that but they kind of dive into a community and it's neat to see, especially like a little Sahara, you know, having lunch with the mayor and, and listening to what an impact that event has made to her community. Um, so, and from like a manufacturer standpoint, um, it gives uh, the, all the different manufacturers an opportunity to meet people in those specific regions um, and, you know, show their new, you know, UTVs to them and, and, and you know, firsthand. Um, uh, so the, the places that UTV taker goes are, are neat for that. And I, uh, the manufacturers are, are hungry to get back to, you know, doing all of that. Speaking of, of the vendors, you've, like you were saying, your, your team can am now, um, what's, uh, what's one of your, um, I know you're, what you're, you're driving an X3, uh, is it, a, is it an RR or, uh, yes, uh, it's in the, the vehicle I have on this trip is a, a 2021, um, X3, uh, it's the, uh, RR. So it's 195 horsepower, uh, and it's the one with the smart shocks. Gotcha. How, how are you liking the smart shocks? That's something relatively new to the, to the Can-Am game, something that Polaris has had for a while, uh, but yep. Can-Am got it. And then they've added a few more sensors, a few more things. Uh, how has that ride uh, experience been for you? Well, uh, what what is really neat for on this trip specifically is I'm kind of in a different mode when I'm doing adventure rides and doing rides, especially with Teresa in the in vehicle with me. Um, so I can slow down a little bit and I want to try to make the ride as comfortable as possible for us. Um, so we're enjoying it. We're, so I'm, I'm not, you know hauling through the dunes as fast as I can. I'm, I'm cruising, I'm looking around, you know, trying to see, uh, what's, what's what. And, uh, the smart shocks allows you to, you know, switch from comfort sport, sport plus, so you can firm or soften up the suspension. And plus it has, um, its own, uh, um, intelligent into it to, you know, firm up or, or soften up depending on what you're doing and how you're driving. And have you found that, you know, with the basic trails, like a question that I get a lot is, is it worth it to jump up to the smart shock 
versus the base model or versus the whatever trim. Um, when you're when you're talking about some of these rides on graded roads and things like that, are you finding that it's it's worth the value, or do you think it's in the desert where you went to the Grand Canyon and you had some off some off camber stuff in the in the in the dirt? Like, is that where it, it, you're finding the more value, or is it something that I think everybody should look at? I, I think it comes down to cost, <laughs> what you're willing <laughs> to spend. Um, for me, I like to have the um, ability to adjust on the fly, you know, the suspension and what we're doing. You know, if we're going to be hitting a bunch of G outs in Johnson Valley or something like that, you know, <clears throat> I want to be on the fly, be able to, you know, click that to as firm as possible. So you can come over without, you know, bottoming out. Um, going through some, you know, chatter bumps. I, I want to be able to soften it up as, as much as possible. So it's, it's not uh, as harsh of a ride. So I, I think um, it's super important, but it depends on where you ride and how you ride. You know, if it was just me and not, you know, how, if I didn't bring Teresa on some of these things, maybe it wouldn't be quite as important. You know, if all I did was dunes, I would just have it set up just do dunes and and right. i'd probably be okay but i like to do everything i mean i'm i'm rock crawling yeah if you're if you're somebody that's limited in your riding scope buy something that's made for that riding scope if you're somebody that gets out and travels and does everything try to find all the flexibility in your suspension you can find it and smart shocks sure. is a way of doing that without having to get out of the car Un especially if you're harnessed up you know pumper helmet comms all these things that then tie you to your car, right? Having to get out and do go do clickers at four points in your car. I mean, if you have yeah. the option to just push a button, why not get that? Yeah. Yeah. Even if, if it's just a three switch thing, you know, uh, you know, Fox has a, right. A the three way click adjust, yep. you know, three way clickers. Even that is, is more than people want to do sometimes. It's, right. it's amazing. You know, how lazy we get, but I, it's nice just to be able to click it on the right. on the dash and get whatever you want. Yep. So and and like you were saying, it especially comes back to cost. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. And, and and lately over the last year it's been availability, right? <laughs> like if the car is even available to buy. It it's amazing. Not just um trying to get a UTV, um, but a lot of aftermarket parts. Right. Um everybody's having a hard time getting getting things in a in a timely manner you know just to build all the different products right we saw so, we saw a scarcity uh mid-year last year start to happen but i think that was because of the explosion of purchasing not because of the supply and then now we're starting to see the ripple effects of what COVID did to our industry uh the manufacturing yeah. of these parts right and we're starting to see the ripple effect now become scarce because we just can't get the parts in time uh the materials yeah. in time I've talked to a number of manufacturers that, you know, they they have 90% of what it takes to put that thing on the shelf, but they have that one thing that's just held back, whether that, that be uh, uh, become silicon for a chip, the manufacturing for a, a computer chip that goes into that circuit board, like the rest of the circuit board's there, but that one chip's not there, or whether that be material like raw, raw material from wherever it's coming from, or um, just the fact that things are held up in port because they don't have the staff to... Uh, with all the regulations on spacing and distancing and all this other stuff that they just can't process as much as they used to. Um, there's just so many different ripple effects in our industry from all this. And I and I think that uh, the last uh, couple that I heard, uh, they were talking like there's about a six month buffer somewhere in there uh, when they can start actually getting back up to speed. And um, yeah. I know like, um, you know, like even even the automotive industry, like Ford, right? Like they've got a bunch of trucks that are on order and they can't even fulfill them yet and, uh, right. until till that supply chain starts back up. So um, I think that uh, there's a lot of community angst over buying new cars that aren't available. And, and they're like you were saying earlier in the podcast about, you know, the timelines on how long it takes to get something to market is now just longer because of even these challenges, right? So there's a lot of uh, discussion about, you know, hey, there's a few different rumored cars coming out, you know, in the near future that people keep pushing on when's it's going to happen? When's it going to happen? It's like, you know, honestly, well, there's so many challenges involved here. There's so many dynamics involved here. We can't even we can't even speculate. Well, and beyond just a supply chain, it's also a, a point of okay, when's the right time to launch this? Right. So because that dynamics um, changed too. I mean, there used to be kind of a, a set schedule for this, and now it's all up in the air. Well, and from uh, a manufacturer 
intro, everybody's doing it different now. I mean, yeah. it, it was changing before, you know, with social media and everything, the way manufacturers brought new things out uh, has changed. I mean, way, way back when, when I started and even before, um, we used to sign embargoes. We used to go ride the vehicle before it was public, um, have our stories and videos and everything all done. And then it launches right. and that almost never happens anymore. Right. Um, so the, the whole dynamic of releasing things, and then you, you sprinkle COVID in on that. And, you know, some of the manufacturers aren't, they can't even do an event. Right. Um, I, I mean, like the, we, we, I, I did the whole smart shocks, uh, release with can am, um, there was no media event or anything. I got, I flew back to Maryland and, and got to, uh, hook up with, uh, Travis Pastrana and, uh, Hubert Roland, right. um, and got to experience that, but it was a super tight, small group. Um, and you know, nobody from Can-Am corporate from up in Canada was there. It was all a United States based team going place to place, uh, getting the content. So gotcha. it's it, it, totally new. And, and, you know, if we look back, I mean, even just a couple of years ago, right. It would, it would be like, there would be a, a, the small group that gets the intro the week before the dealer meeting. And then there would be the dealer meeting, which everybody got all the specs and the pamphlets and the, and the ordering in. And then there would, the next week after that, then it would go out to the public. Right. And now it's even the dealers are almost kind of in the dark on a lot of this stuff where they don't even really have insight on, you know, what's coming down the pipe because all they know is that they get so, from the few dealers that I've talked to in the recent past, they basically are just open books to the dealership, to the OEs and whatever you got, you're going to send it. So we'll just take whatever you got. And, um, you know, they, they don't even care per se what it is, but, but they don't even know what's coming down the pipe anymore. It's more of like, we just get what we get and we're going to sell them and we're going to move forward. Like, there's really no industry insiders anymore. That that used to be a thing, you know, a couple of years ago where people were like just in the know because they were always around these product launch media events and all this other stuff. You know, that kind of personality is no longer really a thing. It's now more of the people that know are the people that know at corporate <laughs> and then uh, the big personalities. Yeah. And there's some, uh, you know, uh, the, as the manufacturers lean on ambassadors uh, to launch these things, there are, there are some people in the industry, um, that might know, you know, racer or an ambassador or something right. like that, that might know something, but n none of those guys, uh, are, are talking because if they did, they wouldn't be an ambassador with that. <laughs> they wouldn't be where anymore. they're at. So a lot of it's, it, the internet's an interesting thing, watching people, uh, you know, chatter back and forth on what's next and who knows what and everything. And, yeah, you just kind of have to leave it and, you know, all right, you guys go talk about speculating. Right. Off you go. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I don't really want to take up too much of your time today, but uh, where can we find you guys online? How can we follow your adventure? And uh, yeah, tell us how we can connect with you. So uh, UTV guide on, on Facebook and uh, Instagram we're posting there, but uh, Teresa and I also have a Facebook group uh, uh, called John and Teresa's Epic Adventures. Um, and, and that's where we're putting all the stuff about this trip. So it's not uh, just, you know, on UTV guide, I'm just doing the off-road portions, but if you want to follow where we're going everywhere um, it's over on um on our Facebook group. And we've got links to that in on our, uh, different social and UTV guide. And, um, yeah, we'll be, we'll be going for another couple of weeks here. And, um, I, you know, the, the neat thing about this trip for us is, you know, experiencing all that, but, um, we wouldn't be able to go off and spend a whole month doing all this thing, all these things without, you know, partners that are able to help us do this. I mean, can right. has been a, a, a big supporter of that, but we've also got a few other partners that are really helping uh, on this trip. Uh, Rugged radios, uh, SSV works um, for audio and uh, system three tires. Um, they've all kind of helped uh, make sure this whole uh, adventure is happening. So uh, I'd really like to, you know, 
thank them for their support and uh yeah, and there's tons of other people that help us with with everything but uh, uh it, it's it's a neat adventure for Teresa and i and uh we're grateful for the opportunity Rad. Well, thanks for coming on the show today. Uh, if you want to check him out, utvguide.net is his website. You can, like he said, go to John and Teresa's Epic Adventures Facebook group. I, I suggest go follow that because there's some interesting stuff you've posted, like the interview with the mayor of Winoka. Um, there's right. different things about like places you can go to eat and, and all these different things that you're hitting along the way. Uh, that's a lot more than just the off-road part of it. So um, go check him out there. And uh, again, uh, thanks for coming on the show sure. and uh, best of luck and safe travels on your uh, on your trip. Yeah, thank you very much for having us on. All right. Well, guys, you can find us on Apple podcast, uh, Google podcast, all the different places. You can find us on Spotify, YouTube and all those things. And until the next time, guys, peace.